Welcome to episode 44 of the Time Talks podcast, part of the Channel Zero Network. This month I had the honor to speak to Dr. Sandy Grande. Dr. Grande is author of Red Pedagogy, Native American Social and Political Thought, numerous articles, and worked on the Standing Rock syllabus. In this episode, Dr. Grande spoke about education, her work Red Pedagogy, elder care, land, relationality, mutuality, collectivity, time, and breaking binaries. Thank you to Awareness for the Music. Please support this podcast on Patreon if you can. And here's a brief jingle from a fellow Channel Zero Network member. One, two, one, two. Tune in for another episode of Marooncast. Marooncast is a down-to-earth black radical podcast for the people. Our host, hip-hop anarchist Simile the RBG and sex educator and crochet artist KLC share their reflections on maroons, rebellions, womanism, life, culture, community, trap liberation, and everyday ratchetness. They deliver fresh commentary with the queer, transgender, non-conforming, fierce, funny, southern girls, anti-imperialist, anti-oppression approach. Poly ad and bullshit. Check out episodes of Marooncast on Channel Zero Network, Buzzsprout, SoundCloud, Google, Apple, and Spotify. All power to the people, all pleasure to the people. Peace. This goes back to your story of kindergarten. And it was a <laughs> really it was a sad story, a powerful story. And you said that you were kicked out of kindergarten for opening the door to come inside when it was raining. Mm-hmm. And when you went to play, they had boxes of toys separated by gender and you wanted to play with a wooden train. And mm-hmm. you mentioned this is when school you noticed became a site of struggle. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering if you could speak on a time when you started to see through the spectacle of propaganda of U.S. ideology and colonization and kind of open up. I don't know if that story is there or before that or after or if it's a process, but just kind of wanted to frame it around that story. Oh, thank you for opening that way. And actually, it's pouring rain where I am right now. I'm in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, once uh, Sagiog territory. <laughs> so it's funny to think about that now. Yeah, I mean, it took me a while, I have to say. So, I mean, I always had a sense um, something was not right about school, but I think it just made me a pretty kind of uh, angry kid in school, a, a kid, you know, maybe got into a lot of trouble in school. I like to think of myself that I was a good kid out of school. <laughs> Um, but I struggled in school. Uh, I struggled a lot. And so it probably wasn't. And then when I went to college, I went to um, for two primary reasons. I think one was to play soccer and second was to uh, study arts. So my dad's an artist. And I thought probably that was the only way I could even think about continuing this practice of school. If it allowed me to do those two things, then, then I was going to then I was going to be okay with it. But I was telling a group yesterday that I was speaking with, I remember in the beginning, I would tell my mom, like, you know, it's probably just going to be one more day, you know, and then I'm going to, I'm going to quit and come home. And that went on probably for the first semester. (laughs) But being an art student and being a student athlete was a very different kind of schooling experience and probably just what I needed. So, you know, I loved my classes and painting and whatever I took, figure drawing. It was just, you know, I just enjoyed being in that creative space with my peers. And then my days were super regimented, which um, to be honest, I really needed at that time, Uh, almost militaristic regimentation. And probably that was just a time in looking back of just like healing in a way, still not quite knowing what K-12 school is all about, just other than that, I hated it. So it really wasn't until graduate school, which I found my way to very serendipitously. And I remember the class. It was a class in the Social and Cultural Foundations of Education at Kent State University, taught by Dr. Norman Bernier, where we started with The Social Construction of Reality, which is a book by Berger and Luckman. And just the conversations in that, that book and then the conversations we had subsequent in that class and was sort of an introduction to theory and to critical theory in particular, which gave me a whole nother kind of language and way to think about my schooling years, which I never, you know, I felt very liberated in that moment. So I think that's probably still my appeal of theory is it has that potential, has its limits for sure. But I think it has that potential um, to kind of give folks a language to understand what they're experiencing. So it took a very long time. Short answer to your question is it took a really long time. 
And uh, was this this book in this class, or was this kind of when you started to break open a lot of those? I'm sure there's a lot of different branches of of the violence of the K through 12, but when you started to see how it was so embedded with competition and profit yeah. and individualism and those things. Yeah. I mean, it was really the first time that I think I was probably learning and reading in a really um, focused way. And so whether it was a, so then from there, I sort of uh, moved into the cultural foundations of education as my kind of um, area of a study or to the foundations of ed. And then, so you have to take courses in philosophy and sociology and, you know, psychology of ed, all the different sort of disciplinary foundations. And I think each class did two things, probably gave me a certain language and insight to what, you know, the ideological structure of this thing we call school, which helped me then see even more clearly what I understood intuitively, I think, as its limits, as in its erasures, as its disavowals, as its other kinds of violences to people and communities that, you know, outside of the Western capitalist settler, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, paradigm, I guess. And, uh, you know, while you were still in the, the academy and studying, wasn't a red pedagogy, Native American social and political thought, it was at first going to be your dissertation, but it was kind of shot down and then yeah, it was my first proposal. And it was so, you know, summarily and by at least one person kind of aggressively rejected <laughs> in this manner that I mean, it was which was which probably was the best thing that ever happened um, in, for two reasons. One, it was so summarily dismissed that it was clear to me it was a fight not worth fighting. You know, if they were kind of tepid about, well, let's see, you know, I might have spent my time spinning my wheels endlessly. And the central critique was sort of like, OK, you've done all this reading, you've done all this sort of, especially in foundations, it's sort of, you know, a lot of breadth. And they were like, this is the time to focus on a question and so we don't understand if you're like writing about land or if you're writing about governance, or if you're writing about women or if you're writing about education and, you know, you have to choose one of the things. And I was like, well, you, you can't write about land without writing about women, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, especially if you have a conception of land, you know, for us anyway, as mother and what that relationality means in this in the register of the feminine or even gender, I guess. Um, and then you can't write it about it without thinking about structures of governance and politics. And you can't. So I just like write that. I'm like, okay, I'll choose something else. And and I just chose something really inane. I never looked back. I wrote it, you know, relatively quickly. And that, that was that. Um, and the other thing I think it ultimately did a service to is I can't imagine bringing this book through a process of, for those folks that have written dissertations of the kind of like surveillance that happens in that process, I wouldn't have wanted to, this book to be subjected to that, you know? So it was, it was very, once I was done, people are just, somebody told me, just put whatever you want to write and create a folder on your desktop that's labeled the book and put your stuff in there. And then when you're done, you can write the book. And I, and that's what I did. I was so grateful for that advice. And it was just a far better process, I think, being able to work, work it through on my own, so to speak. And there wasn't anybody on my committee that would have been helpful to the, I do wish I had, you know, the opportunity to be with graduate students or professors and committee members at it would have been helpful to be in conversation with. It was early on, so there wasn't the field of Native American Indigenous Studies was not even really established as a field yet. There was just sort of folks out there writing, but um, not really a field yet in the academy. Thank you for sharing that story and you know, just uh, beautiful how it came out and so grateful for the work and always learning from it. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. And, uh, my, my next question is, I know you've, you were, you're a caretaker for your father for mm -hmm. quite some time now. And I was wondering if you could speak about the importance of intergenerational work and solidarity and against loneliness and and some of the new writings and thinkings that you're working on that that weave these topics. Yeah, thank you for that question. I, I think about that all the time now, in part because it's my new project, um, working on a 
a book on Indigenous aging and elders. Started um, working on that project shortly after, probably a year or two after my mom passed. She passed in 2014. She she was chronically and acutely ill for a long time, like pretty much over a period of 10 years. And then I hospiced her in 2014 until she passed on. And then at that time, my dad, very different experience caring, doing care work for my dad than my mom. Because by the time I started to care intensively for my mom, she was quite ill. And my dad, he's 93 now. So in 2014, he was, wow, I'm really bad at math. So maybe you can do that math. (laughs) He was younger than 93 anyway. And very, you know, independent, strong, healthy, could do everything on his own and really right up until the start of the pandemic. So it was, it's only been of the course of this time for lots of reasons. Some of it accelerated and animated by the pandemic. I think absent that he, he would still need um, assistance at this point, but, but not as much as probably he needs now. So this experience has been more like just spending time in our parallel lives together. And so I'm learning even more things than I learned with my mom or just different things, I guess. And I think what it, how it informs my, I mean, two things, I think. Um, I recently gave a talk to the Association of for the Study of Higher Education or the ASH conference, where it's the first time I put like my thoughts about education and my thoughts around elder care work sort of in conversation with each other. And probably the main thing that I've started to think about is understanding this cycle of life, which most people understand as a as a point of decline, as as really a point of transition, and in some ways a, a deeper level of empowerment, particularly as they prepare themselves uh, to, to transition to the you know to their own next phase, their own world for us for the Quechua. There's four different worlds that are always in in dynamic with relationship to each other anyway. And so I think about that alongside where we are in this, you know, phase of capitalism, this phase of the settler colonial project, which seems to be imploding in some ways. You know, I know it goes through its own cycles, so I don't think I'm naive enough to think like it's at its end, which is, you know, part of a sort of a linear thinking around it. But it does seem to be in a moment of its own kind of death throes where it's sort of turning on itself. I think January 6th is a really interesting example of that. <laughs> and so times of transition and that if thought about in that way to me are, are also moments of possibility. And so um, it helps me to, as we sort of live through this phase of just what feels like extreme violence every day, to reframe it as, you know, what are the conditions of possibility that this provides? And it's just so much more helpful, at least for me, to think about it in that way. Thank you for sharing that. And listening to your your other talks of, of on this topic, it made me really think about mutuality mm. and uh, COVID as well. And just how it's kind of opened that up more. Well, there's a lot more talk about mutual aid, but... and. And also like how stores started making time for for uh, elders and things like that. Mm. And I heard you mention one example of a runner's club that was put together where people run towards maybe a person in need in the community as a form of exercise and did yard work for them or someone in the community. I felt that was a really, a really cool example of. Yeah, I think that was in New York where people set that up. Um, it was amazing to see, you know, so it, so it kind of gives you a window that the capacity is always there. The capacity, the need, the desire, the suppression of that is so intense, I think. You know, I was talking to a crew yesterday. It was myself, a grad student, Darian, and an, and an elder scholar, retired professor. And at one point, and Darian identifies as black. And, you know, he's Darian. At one point in the conversation, he said, you know, the three of us were never really meant to be in conversation with each other, if you think about it. <laughs> and, and he was also thinking more explicitly about the intergenerational aspect of our conversation. And then it reminded me that anytime in a classroom that I've, which I try to do typically more regular than I have this in this most recent time, but where I have either 
you know, alumni from that particular institution or folks from the community, um, seniors from the community or older adults from the community come in to talk to students. And it's unequivocally, the students talk about that as like their favorite classes. And then we often have conversations around how they don't realize themselves how bizarre it is to have spaces of learning where there's only usually a single generation in that room and how powerful and wonderful it was to have at least two generations in a room. And then what would it mean to have multiple generations in a room? Just the expansiveness that comes to everybody's thinking, everything really is always tremendous. And so I was saying to this crew that I was talking about yesterday, it's almost like you know, there is that moment, just like the way you opened us, there's usually that moment for students, if they allow it for themselves, when they realize like all the, everything they were taught in school about, particularly about U.S. history and what garbage it was. <laughs> and then they kind of get angry and they're like, why didn't we, why didn't anybody tell us this before? Mm -hmm. And it's almost like that level of like, why don't we do this more often? You know, why don't we have, you know, older adults in our spaces of learning more often? And, and I think about that a lot because I think people don't even realize the degree to which they want they want that and they desire that. Yeah, thank you for thank you for breaking those stories open. Yeah, it makes me think about how you had mentioned before a lot of the work you do in the college classroom is kind of break open these old performativities that K through twelve did, and, and like you said, the propaganda of history being one or ageism and all those things and that's that's a lot of work to do in the classroom it's just to kind of break those open but how liberating it is once you do if you can yeah it's even harder now and I think about the folks just entering the academy as new professors and stuff and the kind of pressures um you know whether it's you know fear of students recording them or like you know all the the CR anti-CRT junta that's out there. Oh, <laughs> just, yeah. They have all kinds of, you know, you know, it's it's intense. It's the first time. So I'm full professor, well beyond tenure, but this is my first appointment in a public institution. And even I think about for the first time in my career, I th I have way more thoughts about, you know, what I'm saying, where and how. I think I'm always careful, but, you know, it's very different to think about what that means and how that can potentially shift, you know, these spaces of exchange where we supposedly supposedly have like to be open to, to free exchange. I still like to think I don't fetter myself, but I do think about it. Yeah. I, I wanted to stay on the topic of intergenerational teaching and collectivity. And you worked on the, the amazing document on the Standing Rock syllabus. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the Defenders of the Water School, maybe some of its influence and importance that you saw. Yeah, boy. So um, Elena Eagleshield is really the um, person that got that running on the ground with her own crew of folks initially. A few of the folks from that original crew are continuing on with that work, and there should be something a bit more public about a new school, new venture coming out uh, maybe this summer. So I just wanted to first say that that work has never stopped and it's continuing. And it, and that crew of people that works with Elena are just amazing, amazing young folks. It's, a, I mean, but it, it, you know, any sort of schooling model that, whether it's the freedom schools or, you know, of past or current, you know, they, they have the, their own struggles to kind of find a different way, not because for lack of vision, I think, but the level of surveillance and governance of spaces of learning is really intense. Once you, once you, you know, think we're going to set out, whether it's a group of parents, you know, trying to create a charter school of some kind, or, you know, a group of community folks trying to dedicate themselves to a freedom school, the, re the intervention and the, the overreach of the state is pretty intense um, because at the end of the day, they're like, oh, well, you can do uh, whatever you want, but you still have to take this test or there's still going to be these measures or there's still going to be whatever. So, so it's a hard space to create alternative ways of learning. But so 
given that, I just appreciate the persistence of peoples and the Defenders of the Water School and all other efforts um, that really just kind of persist pretty relentlessly that there's got to be another way of, of engaging this that can either sit alongside the traditional public school or, you know, maybe at some point um, just become a different model for how we think and do schooling. It's challenging, though. It's challenging. Thank you for I'll, I'll look forward to that and, and look into that info when it comes out. Yeah, she'd be a great guest to have, actually. Oh, yeah. That would be, yeah, that would be awesome. I would love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll try to put you all in touch, but okay. she talks wonderfully about the project and 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 the folks she works with are awesome. Awesome. Uh, I wanted to speak about the term uh, decolonization and maybe how you see it being changed or changing or being reinterpreted or possibly co-opted in some way by some institutions. And when I spoke to Lewis Gordon, he said the term may now need to be decolonized itself. Um, <laughs> and I believe he was referencing that in that it should be tied to land back and it's getting separated from that in some in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's amazing the speed at which terms get get co-opted and appropriated and colonized these days. I think once something enters the lexicon of the institution, any institution, you're kind of already dead in the water. <laughs> but, but I agree. I mean, the thing about decolonization is uh, at the very basic level, I, of course, I agree with Lewis that if you're engaging a project of decolonization, it should be attached to intricate and intimate knowledge of how whatever that thing is, has been colonized. Like what was the colonial project that you are now trying to work against? Mm -hmm. And it often doesn't, projects often don't have that attachment. And so because colonialism looks so different globally in different contexts and different spaces, it should be that decolonial projects also look differently. So here in the U.S. and other sort of settler states, Canada, obviously Australia, New Zealand, et cetera, I agree. It, it The foundation really should be around land and the colonization of land. And so if you're working on a decolonial project in the U.S. and you aren't beginning with conversations around land back, return of land as a as a material practice, but also beyond, you know, the actual return of land, I think land back also speaks to the ways in which land is a relation and a whole, and if you understand what that means, if if you understand what it means to live in relationship to land deeply, then that in and of itself suggests a whole nother episteme, a whole nother way of being, a whole nother on, you know, a whole nother ontology, which in and of itself would change, you know, how you're learning, how you're engaging with people, and that really needs to be the basis. And it often isn't. I don't, I've lost track of what people think it is. I think more more often than not, it's used as a stand in for like at its worst for like diversity or something. And there's they're so not the same thing. <laughs> and in some ways, this kind of the liberal project of diversification can work against the decolonial project. So, yeah, it's a problem. Mm, yeah. Kind of like the term inclusion and stuff, how it that can mean in some instances like inclusion into colonial structures yeah, and stuff like into that. What? Yeah, absolutely. Inclusion into what? Access to what? Even equity, equal share of what? <laughs> That's usually my question. <laughs> Stolen land and labor? I, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. I wanted to talk about, you've spoken about the term hospicing the university and your excellent essay, Refusing the, the University and how it's an arm of the settler state. And you quote the term under commons by Moton and Harney that speaks on fugitive spaces. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you can share some ongoing thoughts you've had on some emerging fugitive spaces and where you see more collectivity, reciprocity, and mutuality happening. Yeah, thanks for that. So, and I do want to say that the work uh, initial work on hospicing really comes out of Vanessa Andriotti and the folks that she writes with. Um, she's a professor at UBC. So that's Ka Kasha Hennecke, Dallas Hunt. I think in their article on the, it's a long neat title. So I always forget the name of it, but it's on like cart cartographies. Yeah, I continue to think about that primarily. I think as I said before, 
um, because of the, the care work that I do and the thinking I'm doing around, you know, the actual practice of hospicing peoples and elders in particular, especially in this, you know, time of COVID when we lost so many older adults and elders and indigenous communities in particular, what that meant for them, the loss of elders from those communities is immeasurable, an an immeasurable loss, because for many, you know, elders to a large degree are archives of language, of history, of of ancestral knowledge, of all kinds of things. So it's devastating. In terms of the university, I do think, you know, if there's all this energy also animated by COVID of what's going to happen to the university um, and lots of efforts to sort of reform, enter reformist spaces and to save it. And I don't know, it just might need to, this model again, you know, that was in the U.S. enabled and came up constitutively through stolen indigenous land and enslaved labor. It could be time, and that's what they suggest too in this article. So it's called Mapping Interpretations of Decolonization in the Context of Higher Education. And it's Vanessa Andriotti, Sharon Stein, Kasia Henneke, and Dallas Hunt. Um, they developed this cartography of like the kinds of interventions that one can make into rethinking the university, of which the sort of end point, when, if you're at a point where you're sort of thinking it's beyond form, is this a moment where we think about hospicing the university? And I would agree with them. I think it's time. You know, and, I, you know, the thing about hospicing, which I was, you know, speak about a little bit in the article, but more in some of the talks that I'm giving now is it's a real, unless you've been in that space yourself, I think there's lots of misunderstanding around it, but it's really, you know, a time where in a space that's very complicated, but it's also fundamentally very caring. So I think there's a way in which we can sort of honor, in a sense, the role the university played the Settler University played up to this point, but that we need something else. And like, unless this model sort of dies, we prevent it actually from this other, whatever's going to come up in its place. We just forestall that process. And it's the forestalling of any kind of death or the disavowal of any kind of death, I think is so damaging and violent. And at some point, I think we just need to let it go. In terms of the relationship to kind of fugitivity, so that, so the undercommons is, yeah, Stefan O'Harney and Fred Moten's work, you know, and they're a little bit more situated in the Black radical tradition. And I think um, the notion of fugitivity as it emerges through that tradition makes a lot of sense. It's super helpful to think about fugitive spaces of learning, what it means as it came through for them, like in the project of freedom schools, probably primarily, which is a kind of a space of learning that's very distinctive that I think indigenous, you know, extra institutional projects like Dichinta, like the Defenders of the Water School, need to be in conversation with and share a lot of ideological kinship and political kinship, but are different spaces. Um, so, so I like thinking about them as these sort of distinctive, to some degree, political projects, but that ones that need to be in conversation with each other. And at some point, or as has already happened, I guess at multiple points in coalition and solidarity to think through how can these, you know, how can we think together to imagine what's what's beyond, what is beyond, what are beyond these spaces of schooling that we've been subjected to specifically at the point of their inception. I feel it makes sense for indigenous and, you know, indigenous peoples and black peoples to think together <laughs> about beyond these models that again were built were built on our on our backs and on our lands and on our lives. Oh, thank you very much. I was wondering if you could break open the the concept of time more, mm. such as colonial time and quote progress and how it fights relationality. And a lot of your writing and even the stuff you were talking about earlier on elder care of moving at a different pace or walking with the slowest or just slowness and and it's um and how slowness is always being fought by capitalism as well yeah and you make many great points on the inherent western thought and colonizing rhetoric that marxism often employs and just how time and colonial time creates invisibility and erasure i was just wondering if you could break open these concepts more some thoughts you have on this 
Yeah, well, that's a good, um, you know, you offer a good summary in a sense. I think time to as the way that we typically think about it, in addition to being such a, you know, so tied to kind of capitalist logics and colonialist logics, it's also tied to the human condition insofar as we think about the human or even the man, I guess, if we want to think about Sylvia Winter's work as well, in ways that um, just completely, I don't know, doesn't even take into consideration the way time passes in other, among other living things, right? So in this conversation I had yesterday with, again, my this graduate student and a, and a retired professor, they were talking about a project a youth with youth um, in a nearby community who are just at the beginning point of thinking about like food justice and community gardening and things like that. And they've had this project going on and young people, once they start, you know, a relationship with the land, it changes their own conception of time and their own, con- their own way in which they need to be patient, you know? And he was saying like a young person was, was like, you know, you plant something and you're not going to see it in two minutes <laughs> <laughs> or even maybe two months. It takes a long time. And in that period of time, all the work you really need to do to, to tend and to care for, for you know, your seedling before you see something emerge. And, and, you know, other than human life has its own cycles that it works to. And so I think, again, just understanding the various kinds of relations that we should have, humans should have beyond the human I think opens us up to a diff- different registers of time. And so when I think about elders, I do think about, you know, obviously the immediate of working, you know, alongside my dad and when I was caring for my mom, you know, but we have, you know, the for us it would be the Apus, but the but the, you know, the mountains are our ancestors, the rivers, the oceans. They have been here for so long, giving life to us and so many other creatures and beings. And so though, to me, those are very much um, our elders and our ancestors that we just, you know, often just doesn't get thought about, especially in, in spaces of learning. Um, and especially, I would say, the university, even if like you're studying life, it's it's in this, you know, you're in like a, you know, a bio lab or something where mm. you're like dissecting it and not necessarily appreciating it as the space of knowledge or as an elder, as an ancestor. And I really love this quote from your book where you say, read pedagogy, spaces and hope, not the future-centered hope of the Western imagination, but rather a hope that lives in contingency with the past, one that trusts the beliefs and understanding of our ancestors, as well as the power of traditional knowledge. Mm. Yeah, that quote seems to speak to a lot of people. And and I wonder, I mean, I think about it in terms of whether was I talking about hope or was I talking about faith, or maybe those aren't necessarily always distinctive things. Because I think for me, when I think about it, I get asked about that quote about a lot, quite a bit. And um, I think it's the faith in that, the faith in the knowledge of my ancestors, which had teachings or what sometimes I think get mislabeled as prophecies or whatever about our lives that um, instruct us how to live every day. Um, It's a deep faith in that knowledge that I think is the foundation for what maybe we call hope, maybe is faith. I don't don't really know. I need to think more about that, but. Thank you. I wanted to continue on on the, how education is usually, uh, Western education is usually very human centric and Mm -hmm. it shows humans as being superior to the rest of nature. I really liked the quote where you critiqued Marx on the spider being Mm -hmm. inferior to an architect's mind and stuff like this. And I wonder if you could speak more on these Cartesian or Western thought binaries, such as land versus property, as always seeking to take control of nature and really how some good efforts on where nature's being pushed back into education. Mm. It brings me, so I think I think of two things, one example from my new work and then another from a book I read recently. But yeah, the kind of splits between especially mind and body. Um, I thought a lot about that. My mom toward the end of her life had uh, what some folks call dementia. And 
caring for her through that, all of the, all of what that presented was super challenging, first of all. So anybody out there who's caring for somebody with any kind of dementia, uh, just all kinds of uh, love and strength out to you because it is very challenging. But it also, again, presented such an interesting portal into um, mind and memory and my own understanding, like just ruptured so much of my own understanding of, of how I think about mind and brain and memory and all of that. And so I think there's just a lot to learn about the violence of, of those kinds of splits that have been suggested by, you know, the Cartesian model, the Western model to a large degree. And the one thing I would say just in general about that is, you know, as she neared her own transition, she had a sense of herself as becoming more powerful because she had greater access to these other worlds. Sometimes she would like, well, she often spoke in, in like multiple of her own languages. Sometimes she would completely forget that she sp spoke one of the languages that she spoke. Um, she would have these vivid memories that, you know, when I would check with my relatives or my dad were 100% accurate about her life as a young person. There was even a moment at which she regave birth. Um, it, I mean, all of it is so fascinating. That needs to be sort of its own conversation maybe um but she through all of it she imagined herself as she had access to the world beyond that meant to her that she was um and within our own belief system largely it's elders and babies who have access to these to, to worlds other than what we experience and it was interesting to be with somebody who was coming into their own power at the same time living in a world that saw could only see her as a subject in decline and and eventually not even a subject at all. And that that was, you know, I think presented to me in a really different way, how we experience the violence of, of uh, or the Cartesian kind of model as a form of violence. In terms of like the split between humans and other than human, there's all kinds of, you know, and, and I hope, I hope those kinds of teachings are entering classrooms in, in more ways now than they used to. But I'm particularly appreciative of Alexis Pauline Gum's work. I don't know if you've read any of her stuff, but I highly recommend. Um, it's just a small book, but it's a, such a great book. I think it's called Undrowned Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals. Um, and it's really her own journey through kind of learning with and alongside marine mammals. And it's really and I and it's probably one of the I taught it last semester. I will teach find a way to teach it next semester. Um, but it's probably a book, again, that my students really appreciated more than any others um, because it really changed a perspective. It, it, it triggered something and again, you know, again, triggered one of those moments. It's like, why don't we learn like this more often? Why don't we think in these registers more often? And the kind of relief that comes from decentering the human, even for them, was just wonderful to watch. Like we don't always have to be like what 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 yeah when you decenter the human, it does so much, I think. And I think for them, particularly as we were kind of living through some of the thick of the pandemic, it it just felt liberating for them or kind of a relief. More than liberating, I think it was just a relief. Like we don't have to have, we don't have to be the center of the universe or the center of any answers, the center of anything. And so as I highly recommend that book. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to check that out. Uh, I'm kind of a, a leap year affiliate faculty to where I get I get to teach a class here and there <laughs> at Regis. And, uh, <laughs> and then I just get not invited back for a couple of years and I'm back a lot. So. <laughs> but, and uh, when I when I do teach, I always use Braiding Sweetgrass mm. as one of my textbooks and mm -hmm. students just love it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't wait to read this book. Thank yeah, you. and it's just, a, I mean, honestly, you could read it in an afternoon and you want to, you want to linger with it, but, you know, you can definitely and do a first read in an afternoon. It's a great book. Wow. Okay. I'm going to get it right away. It's probably one of my last questions here. Okay. Uh, you've written about the balaclava politics and the, mm -hmm. the importance of the Zapatistas. And I was wondering, what are some kind of collectives that excite you right now or some some more thoughts you've had on on this topic 
Yeah, one of the collectives that I feel um, really akin to or appreciate their work is definitely the Red Nation, which is based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Jennifer Marley, Nick Estes, Melanie Yazi were all integral to the foundation of that. And many, many, many others. That's definitely a collective. As somebody who's lived in New York for a while, I was, you know, participated with the folks of Decolonize This Place, um, which is an umbrella sort of collective of lots of different organizing groups in New York City that have just done some really great work. And most recently, their efforts organize, were organized through the Strike MoMA movement or Strike MoMA Collective, which is really trying to bring attention to how, you know, really the colonization of how we even understand art and kind of what has become the corporate industrial project of the, of the uh, complex of the art world. Mm. Um, and how, and like really doing amazing work to do the crosswalk between like who sits on these boards and some, you know, kind of that level of a corporate elite and what their reach is into so many other projects. And so I, I really appreciate, I would say, um, that as a recent collective. Uh, Emily Johnson is also working with a lot of folks in the city to to protect the East River Park. Um, so it's maybe a smaller collective, but I hope they're successful because it's just it's just an ongoing thing, right? I mean, these um, the tentacles of capital racial capitalism, colonialism, you know, that we experience mostly now. Most people, I think, experience through gentrification. It's just going to keep coming. And so I I really hope that effort is successful and staving it off for now in the East River Park. That's critical to so many communities on the east side of Manhattan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I saw the Strike MoMA talk that you were part of as well, which was really mm-hmm. powerful. And I learned a lot from that. So thank you. Yeah, some great folks there. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Time Talks podcast. I want to thank Dr. Grande for spending some time to speak with me. Please support Dr. Grande's work and pick up a copy of Red Pedagogy. Thank you to Awareness for the music and check out some other podcasts on the Channel Zero Network.